My name is Johanna Wagstaff. I'm a meteorologist and an earth scientist. Every day, I see the effects of climate change through my work. A relentless cycle of extreme weather, terrifying storms, deadly heat domes, wildfires, droughts. But I remain in awe of the natural world and how it finds ways to adapt. And that's what we explore on Planet Wonder. You're gonna tell me everything from the beginning. Where are your friends now, huh? We have ways of making you talk. What happens to you matters. It matters to all of us. Ah, he's not gonna talk. But that has me wondering, what does the snow know about climate change? Snow, glorious snow. The thing that grabs the most attention when it's in my forecast. The mystery of it, the delight in it, the fear of it. Fascination with the white stuff is especially pronounced in Canada. We are a nation of snow. 65% of our landmass is covered by snow for more than six months of the year. But that's changing as our planet warms and the change is having big consequences. First of all, snow is bright, which means a huge amount of sunlight that hits the snow is reflected back into space instead of warming the earth. But as we lose snow cover, the land becomes darker, the colors of soil or vegetation, which absorbs the sun's energy instead, like wearing a black t-shirt on a hot day. Snow is also like a giant blanket, insulating the soil beneath the snowpack to protect plants and animals from cold winter temperatures. The depth and timing of that winter snow impact the ecosystems hidden below, including for us humans. Many parts of Canada rely on winter snowpacks for drinking water. The accumulation of snow during the winter and subsequent melting in the spring and summer regulate runoff and stream flow. Snow is also vital for hydroelectric power generation, for winter sports, tourism, and travel. And it's a key part of the way of life for many Indigenous people who've depended on snow for their livelihoods for thousands of years. Most of Canada has already experienced a decrease in snow accumulation by a rate of 5 to 10% per decade since the 80s. And we're getting that first snow later and the spring melt earlier. These trends will only accelerate as our planet continues to warm. To learn more about how climate change is impacting our snowpack, we travel to Strathcona Provincial Park on Vancouver Island to meet up with Bill Floyd, a research hydrologist who spends most of his job outside in the snow. So Bill, big picture, why is snow so important? I've been thinking about this question and my whole career I've been thinking about this Probably. question. Probably. <laughs> but the, in the context of today, I mean, we're in an area that the most obvious thing why it's important is because look what we're doing. Yeah. We're skiing on it. Yeah. And culturally it's really important, right? There's mm -hmm. ski industry, there's winter industry, there's all kinds of things that rely on snow. When we zoom out from just our like immediate needs and connection of touching the snow. Snow at a big scale is a really important source of water. In terms of drinking water supply or just general water supply, it acts as a, as a, as a storage unit mm -hmm. that delays the exit of that water from a system. So in the winter, in high elevation, your snow accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And then during the spring and summer, it slowly melts. That's the ideal situation is a slow melt and it contributes to water that's required for fish, water that's required for people. Wait, the size of the snowpack also affects animals. Let's go down the rabbit hole. Southern Mountain caribou are a population of woodland caribou known as snow caribou. They're unique in that their huge hooves allow them to float on deep snow to reach arboreal lichen, their main winter food source. These caribou depend on large patches of old growth forests to survive, especially through tough winters. Industrial development and extraction, primarily logging, have impacted the old growth forests that these caribou depend on. We've seen this population decline by alarming 30% in the last 15 years. Snow caribou are well adapted to living in deep snow, and they use this to their advantage by heading to the higher elevations in winter, where they can escape predators, especially wolves. Decreasing amount of snow from climate change limits their access to their main winter food source, lichen found on trees. 
It also means predators are able to navigate the higher terrain, putting caribou at greater risk. This is doubled with pressure from logging and habitat fragmentation, which leaves caribou vulnerable. Caribou are an important cultural species to people across Canada. They are also considered an indicator species, meaning that they reflect the health of the larger ecosystem. If caribou are declining, it means that the forests and watersheds that we also depend on are in trouble. Protecting the old growth forests that Southern Mountain Caribou call home is important not just for the survival of the iconic species, but as a natural solution to climate change to help us mitigate and adapt to a changing climate. <laughs> Should we go play in it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's get in the snow. I mean, we can dig in it. We're going to measure it. Let's today. dig in it. So. Okay. This is a type of ruler. So, by driving this into the ground, you get a snow depth. The other thing is it's hollow yeah, and it collects a core and a core of snow. So you can take that core of snow, lift it out, and then you weigh it. Right. And then that weight tells you basically how heavy that water is, the mass of that water. And from that, you can figure out how much water is stored in the snowpack. Forecasting snow water equivalent for snow events is one of the hardest parts of my job. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So okay. I can maybe I'll... Do you usually make bets? before you measure <laughs> well, how deep we, it is? We know how deep it is. The bets are <laughs> the bets are usually like density, like how dense uh, is the snow, so how much does it weigh? I'm gonna say that the density is probably like, I'll say 32%. Okay. I, I may be wrong. So I'm, what, gonna what say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say 52%. 52%, okay. So you probably, you'll feel it sort of biting into something that doesn't feel like snow. That's moss. Yeah. Dirt. So what did we get? So we did that, that uh, density measurement and I, I estimated 30%. Joanna estimated 50 and it was 50.1. <laughs> I would say beginner's luck, but I'm going to chalk it up to um, my meteorology skills. Ooh. This is how we get one measurement in one place. And doing these in enough places, you can get a picture, but in order to get a bigger picture, you use other tools, right? Like weather definitely, stations. Definitely. So we use weather stations, which tell us, they don't necessarily give us more spatial representation as, as something like this. So we could do, a, we could measure this whole opening take 50 of these measurements which will describe this really well the weather station is is essentially only going to be describing a relatively small footprint but it's going to be doing it every five minutes let's go see one so this this station um is different than a lot of stations you'll see different than the province it has more instruments than you would normally yeah. see that measures snow depth through sonic signals so it's called a sonic snow ranger okay which essentially if you listen and we're close to it it would go tick 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 and that sound bounces off the snow surface and then back up to the sensor. It measures how long it takes for that signal to bounce off the snow and back. And from that, you get a distance to the snow surface. Right. And you also, when there's no snow on the ground, you get a distance to the ground. So you actually subtract that distance to the ground, bare earth ground, from the snow surface. And that's how you get snow depth. So we've got these, these manual measurements we've taken. We have weather stations, but they don't describe a very big area. Now we have this plane that flies in the sky or a helicopter that can map snow depth instead of over square meters, over hundreds of square kilometers. Wait, there's more. Derek, thanks for meeting me on the slopes. My pleasure. Always uh, take a chance to get to the ski hill. I, I thought so. I thought you were gonna maybe do a couple of runs after this. Can you tell me how the remote se sensing technology you use works? Sure, so Hakai Institute has a mapping platform. We call it the Airborne Coastal Observatory. And that is essentially a plane with a series of mapping systems on board. And so the main, the main system that we use is a laser scanner and it's, it's an active sensor, meaning it has its own source of, of energy and it is emitting a pulse of energy to the ground and there's targets on the ground that that pulse of energy reflects off of, comes back to the plane. And we can measure the two-way travel time of that pulse of energy 
and basically attach a range to it. So in, in great precision and accuracy, we're able to map in a cloud the terrain below uh, the airplane. And so that gives you the ability to estimate snow depth over a large area in a relatively short period of time? It does. The, the key thing is to be able to repeat the same areas. And so if we're able to fly over a given area uh, in the summer, say, when there is no snow, and then we will repeatedly map that same area throughout uh, the winter, say once a month, we're able to see how the snow fluctuates and how that fluctuates over space. So how has this changed the game when it comes to measuring snowpack? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, the type of work that Bill Floyd and his team do, where they're in the field and they're taking direct measurements in situ, you're basically getting all these points on a grid, and so you're trying to interpolate between those. But with the Airborne Coastal Observatory, we're able to look at an entire area. So it's like a television where if you turn it on, you're only looking at a couple pixels that turn on with, with uh, the field measurements. As soon as the Airborne Coastal Observatory is taking measurements, the whole TV lights up. That's a great analogy. So what trends have you already seen when it comes to climate change in our snowpack? But what we've been seeing is basically in some areas, declines or rapid pulses of snow um, in some areas. Where we are right now um, at Mount Washington has for the, the past many weeks and months, I think, been on, um, on a uh, have had an issue with drought and, and water scarcity. So I think that's lifting now with the snow coming in, but it's a concern for sure. Well, I better let you uh, test it out officially on the skis, I feel like. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I'll figure it out. making decisions off the very snow data that we just measured. Nobody's going to use that exact snow data. We but, did well though. But we did, we did. <laughs> so the main people that use these data are, there's sort of three groups. You could, you could look at BC Hydro as being one of them. We're actually in, not quite in a watershed that drains into Comox Lake where they use snow data mm -hmm. to estimate how much water is going to be available for power in the spring. Right. So that's one group that would use them. The, another group would be the River Forecast Center. Yep. So that's the team that they have two different sort of, they look at floods, but they also look at low flows. So from a flood perspective, let's say we had a big event coming into the island, they use those data to give them an idea of how much snow is in the mountains. And then if they have that and they see a big system coming in, they can make estimates on how much of that snow is gonna melt, where the freezing levels are gonna be, and then incorporate that into their forecast for public safety. And that includes avalanche forecasts. Scientists are using this information to help people make decisions about avalanche risk. Pascal Heigley, show me your laboratory. So we do this on a 2.5 kilometer grid across most of Western Canada to provide Avalanche Canada with an additional data stream for their avalanche forecasts. This is particularly useful in areas where they otherwise don't have a whole lot of direct observations. Our research in this area focuses on examining how good these models actually are, how we can use observations to correct the models when they drift away from reality, and how to summarize and visualize the information in a way that's actually meaningful for forecasters. Another area that we work on is to better understand how recreationalists actually use the avalanche forecasts. Do they understand the information that's provided in there and how do they use it in their trip planning and risk management process? With more and more people going into the backcountry, it's critical for us to have a better understanding of what works and what doesn't so that we can actually develop products that better resonate with people and allow them to make better informed decisions in a way that actually fits with what they want to do in the backcountry. And then another group that would use these type of data are people that are worried about water supply. And they want to know as well how much water is available. Do we have a really 
low snowpack? Are we going to need to put water restrictions on sooner? Mm -hmm. Do we have really big snowpack? Can people water their lawns potentially a little bit longer? So it's it's a uh, as the season progresses, it gives you a better and better idea of what's going to be available mm -hmm. for people. So I got to go on a ride along with Metro Vancouver as they checked out their winter snowpack, and that included riding in a helicopter, and they let me ride shotgun, that was nice of them. The crew there is sitting in the back while I'm flying over the Capilano uh, snowpack, which is how they determine what the season ahead will look like. So there it is, there's three different reservoirs that Metro Vancouver uses to supply drinking water to 2.7 million residents in the Lower Mainland. And by the way, we're using about a billion liters of water a day, and it's all coming from those mountains. And yes, you guessed it, meter stick measuring. Now this is before I was a pro. Uh, so they did, the crew did the measuring and they found uh, it was about a five meter depth and that helps them tell the story ahead for how much water. See, it is hard work. You do need two people to get through those layers. Tells the story ahead for how much water is available in the summer season. And that brings us to the Seymour Reservoir. So after being in the mountains, I got to go down to that reservoir where all the water is stored and talking to Metro Vancouver, they say, again, it's that extreme variability and needing to plan for the big drought years versus the big atmospheric rivers or the big snow dumps, and that may need expanding our reservoirs. And the other thing to think about, all of our uh, mountain snowpacks are up around 1,500 meters. That's not that high. You know, a 500 meter drop in our snow line will have big differences in the future, but people are thinking about it now. Okay, Bill, what does the snow know about climate change? What does the snow know? So it is, it's an indicator of weather throughout the season, mm -hmm. for sure. And in terms of climate change, there are some general patterns we're seeing that vary year to year, depending on where you are. Like you can still have very big snow years. For sure. With climate change, and you can still have very low snow years. But in general, what we're seeing is uh, increase in the elevation of sort of that permanent snowpack um, related to warming temperatures so it's raining more at higher elevations so you're not getting those sustained snowpacks. You are in some situations actually seeing more snow up high because you're seeing more precipitation but it's coming down as snow. I know what you're thinking if the planet is warming shouldn't we be seeing less snow and therefore less snowstorms? Well, turns out we are seeing less snow on average, but our snowstorms are supercharged. How does that work? Hang on for this science ride. So first of all, we are getting less snow overall, but a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. It's one of the reasons why our rainstorms are becoming more intense with climate change. Also, more snow falls when temperatures are just below the freezing mark rather than when it's extremely cold. So areas of the world that are cold enough to get snow are warming to a temperature that they're actually seeing snowfall events coming down with more precipitation. Warmer oceans are also a factor. Warmer waters off the coast of Atlantic Canada are actually providing more energy for the temperature difference that actually drives those nor'easter storms in wintertime. Also this, as the Arctic warms much faster than the rest of the world, new research is finding a connection to a weakened polar vortex. The band of strong winds that forms above the Arctic every winter is what encloses a large pool of extremely cold air. It's the temperature difference between this cold air and the air of the mid latitudes that drives the speed of this circulation. It's basically a fence that keeps the coldest air up there. But as this Arctic warms and gets closer in temperature to those mid latitudes, the polar vortex gets weaker and meanders more, stretching down to the south. More research is needed to make this connection a definitive one, but that meandering air is being cited as an explanation for recent freezing temperatures in snow in places like Texas. Global climate models actually project an increase in the extreme snowfall events across most of North America, but in other parts of the world, like Western Europe, they project an increase in winter rain rather than snow. With climate change, we have more of these extreme events happening. So you're having potentially more instances when you have extreme events hitting snow on the ground. But when we're talking 30, 50, 80 years into the future, then there's reason to worry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's uh, and that's why we come up with plans 
to become more resilient. We've had it, we've had years where there's been no snow. I'm gonna go ahead and jump on a tangent here. Does it seem to you like the ski season is getting shorter or that pro snowboarders are skiing in slush? Climate change is definitely having an impact on winter recreation. On average in Canada, winter temperatures have warmed 3.5 degrees since 1948, faster than any other season. The latest research suggests the ski season could shorten by 12 to 20% in just 30 years. To adapt, many alpine resorts now offer all season activities, such as summer mountain biking or zip lining, but shorter ski seasons will ultimately mean higher operational costs for businesses. Worldwide warming means it's getting harder and harder to find a suitable location for Winter Olympics. In 1924, the first Olympic Winter Games in Chamonix, France, featured all natural snow and all outdoor events, including ice hockey and figure skating. Nearly a century later, at Beijing 2022, all the alpine events were on artificial snow. In a recent study, scientists looked at the host cities of 19 past Winter Olympics to see how each might fare with climate change. They found that by mid-century, four former Olympic sites, including Chamonix, would no longer have reliable climate for hosting. And by 2080, Vancouver and seven additional cities would join the list of unreliables. And if you think we can just snowmake our way out of this, think again. Ideal snowmaking conditions require less moisture in the air, and our warming climate is a more humid one. Ultimately, Winter Olympics will look very different in the future. How different will depend on how individual countries respond to climate change. So other than, you know, slowing the warming of our planet, are there tangible solutions to protecting our snowpack? You can't make it snow when it's too warm. So ski hills have solutions of making it snow when it's cold, so they can make snow, you can, but you can't do that over entire watersheds. So the only real solutions are, is, is one, you have to know how much snow is out there. And right now, with the methods I was showing you, we don't really know how much snow is out there. Um, so one key part of finding a solution is trying to figure out how much is there. How are you gonna make up for that storage component? So dams, reservoirs, that's, that's essentially what the snowpack is. It's holding snow and delaying its, its release. So areas that already have reservoirs, they may need to think about building them bigger. You can also, of course, conservation, reduce water use, smart planning can be another solution. You can also use, to a lesser degree, land management and forest management to not necessarily make it snow more, but you can do things to slow the melt of that snow. So a forest will, during a big rain on snow event, it's wind, so turbulent energy, it's the energy that basically mixes everything up and drives that wet, warm air into the snowpack mm -hmm. and causes it to melt. You cut that wind off, it's gonna melt, but not nearly at the speed. So forests essentially, that's what they do. They're this, they're this a blanket across the landscape. Snow will generally stay longer in a, in a permanent snowpack underneath forests. So they, they do play a really key role. And if you remove all of them on the landscape, whether that's through agriculture or, or forestry and you do it at a high level, you will alter the hydrology. It's also just upsetting to see the loss of our iconic winter landscapes. For some, that snow is inspiration. Hi, my name is Meg O'Hara and I'm an artist. So I make sure to come out to Banff every year to ski at Sunshine. My art is inspired by the grandeur of the natural world. Sunshine is the perfect combination of amazing mountain views and snow-covered trees. So I love to come out here every year to get some inspiration for my paintings when I go back into my studio. From the snowpack to the reservoirs that give us our drinking water, the feed into the rivers like this one, the trickle down effect of snow is changing. But knowing how much we have to lose is half the battle. And as Dutch artist Antoinette Van Cleef says, when the snow falls, nature listens. So Wesley, 
What kind of snow should we and should we not eat? We should eat fresh, clear snow that's like this. Oh, that's good. But snow that's brown and funky, you should not eat it because it's pink. <laughs> so brown is a no-go. Any other colors that we shouldn't eat? No, no, it's pink. <laughs> nice one.